2 Peter chapter 3. Uh, I, I guess I had forgotten how loaded uh, uh, the letters of Peter are because they are loaded. I, and, and we're talking about being faithful and waiting on, waiting on the Lord. Folks, uh, Peter continues to, to urge his readers to remain faithful in spite of what's going on in this world today. I, I think he might be saying the same thing to you and I. In spite of what's going on in this world today, remain faithful so that we can, uh, you know, we can live a, a life that, that, that would be representative of our Lord and Savior. False teachers were, were, were taken, distorting the truth in what was going on there. They were leading people astray as to the day of the Lord, the coming of Jesus again. And so here we are. They'd so doubt about Christ even returning again. Well, look, he's been gone a long time. He keeps saying he's coming back, but he never does. So I don't think he's coming back. And, and this is what the, they were the, the spreading out there. And so these, <laughs> these Gnostic people, they said, okay, well, if he's not coming back, then that, this morality thing doesn't matter. Let's just, you know, the body is evil anyway. It, only the spirit is good. The body is, is evil. So let's just do whatever you please, and it's okay. So this is what was being spread out there, and Peter is saying, no, 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 remain faithful to Christ. And this day of the Lord thing, guys, uh, let me tell you this, that uh, I remember when Bible prophecy was the hottest topic of Scripture, and it, hadn't been, and, it, and it does this. It does the sign curve thing. It becomes popular, and then it doesn't become popular. It's not as popular now as it was one, because back then, uh, what I remember anyway, you schedule some Wednesday nights, Wednesday nights on you're going to teach the book of Revelation, well, you'll double the attendance. See, we're curious people, guys. Uh, we, uh, we, we wanted to know uh, that all of this prophecy, just re in, in all of the prophecy that we read, just remember this, folks. Few details are revealed. So much remains a mystery. The prophecy gives you uh, the big picture. Now, many tend, uh, now, uh, forgive me if you don't believe this, but Sometimes people tend to read more into a biblical text than is there. Somehow that, that we feel like that every word in Scripture means something else. It doesn't really mean what it says. It means something else. Um, I believe it means what it says. And so uh, just uh, I'm, I'm that simple, I guess. And so, but now one, one thing in all this prophecy and all this thing we're talking about here, we can be sure of the big picture. And, but we still lack all the details, but we know the big picture. Here's the big picture, guys. Christ will physically return. There will be a final judgment. Heaven and hell are real. Resurrection of our bodies is a certainty. Those four things, that's the big picture. So why do we get hung up on all these details? But we do. We remain curious about the future. If you'll notice that, uh, you know, we want to see just above the, the horizon that we see right now. We tiptoe up. Maybe we can see over there uh, just a little bit more detail. I, I need details. I need to know what's going on. Folks, let me tell you, this book right here, the Bible, stands alone as our source of information. If it's in here, it's real, it's true, it's good. And if it's not, somebody's speculating. So let's keep that in mind as we, as we talk about what Peter's talking about here. 2 Peter 3, verses 8, 9, and 10. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Folks, keep in mind this as we... Uh, Peter is telling Israel that the Lord is not slow in coming. 
See, God is not on the same timetable as you and I. We, uh, I, I'm impatient to say the least. Um, you let somebody don't take off the minute that light turns green, and I'm, and and I want them to go. And so it's not. I'm not very patient. But now this, and Peter is also telling the people, stop questioning the trustworthiness of God, and and the end times. It will happen. Nero began an intense uh, period of persecution and execution of Christians in his time. And, and Peter had asked the people to persevere, cling to the truth of Scripture, the truth found in this book right here. Now, Psalms 104, P Peter alludes to Psalms 90, verse 4. He said, For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday, when it passes by or is a watch in the night. That's how the Lord looks at time. Folks, do we need to be reminded, really, Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For if the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Folks, we've got to remember who God is and who we are. See, we measure time past, present, and future chronologically. Now, God uses a different time than we do. We must simply trust God's goodness and his character. Now, I want to tell you, in my career, I was something called a piping designer draftsman. That's what I did for all the years I was working. And we had those big sheets of paper, and uh, Rhonda's husband, James, was... was was just like me. He was he was a little smarter than me, but uh, but we and, and we worked together some on some projects, and he was a different company. But uh, when when you look at those old big drawings, there's lines everywhere, marks all over that drawing. See, I can visualize what that will look like when it's installed, because you get a picture of it after you're doing it so long. You can do that, and. Uh, and so here we are. See, we, uh, we think about that as, as when we look at, we, we know, we can visualize what it is, but we don't know exactly what the future holds for us. But, but this book tells us what to visualize and what that looks like. Now, uh, uh, another British theologian, F.B. Meyer, said this, Do not judge God's ways while they're in progress. Wait until the plan is complete. So when they're in process, we're just guessing so many times, so many times speculation about what's going on. But folks, know this. Know this. 1 Timothy 2, 4. God, our Savior, desires all men to be saved. Folks, that must have been a shocking statement to the Gnostics and also to the many Jewish people out there then that, Lord, you want these heathen Gentiles to be saved too? Yes, it's a desire. See, God in his sovereignty initiates, he structures his covenant for all humans. First Timothy 2, 6 said Jesus came for all people. He gave his life for all people. Now, does that sound like the limited atonement in Calvinism? And not to me, folks. But see, God has mandated humans must respond and continue to respond in faith, repentance, Obedience and perseverance. We must continue to respond like that because Christ died for you and I. You, you want to you enter by the narrow gate, folks? Then by faith you repent. Mark 1.15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Folks, without, uh, you know, w without repentance... Uh, there's little you can do. You have to repent of what's going on in this world. You have to believe that God is and, and just believe him in the gospel here. You know, just as the Jews thought that being a descendant of Abraham was the door to heaven, too many people today believe that being a member of this church or any church is the door to heaven. It's not the door to heaven. The door to heaven 
is by faith repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Folks, that's what we need to, we need to remember in our lives as we go from, uh, from door to door in, in this world that we have. And so God is purpose, purposely delaying his return. And why? He's given us time for unbelievers to decide about Christ. He's given us time for believers to get their act together. As believers, we need to get our act together too. He's given us time of repentance for Christian with a spiritually barren life. You're a Christian, but you, you're not exhibiting the characteristics of Christ. He's given us time to get all that worked out and time to do it. He's given us extra time for us to share the good news of Christ. One of those verses we'll read this morning, it, it, it talks about hastening the coming of the Lord. You mean we can really hasten the coming of the Lord? I think Scripture says that the Lord will come when every person on earth has heard the gospel. Well, if we want to hasten that time, then you share the gospel with people that haven't heard it. And it, it appears to, to hasten the gospel, so just do that. Folks, let me add, when we think about this, this salvation and, and how Christ died for all people, let's make that just a little more personal, if you would. Just imagine if Christ had returned just two weeks or two days before you came to faith, you would have missed salvation before the fires of judgment of hell. Folks, uh, if, if you would, just think for a minute with me here. If, if you want to apply the fact of chapter 3, verse 9, where Peter says that God died for any and all, just do this. Just pick a name that you think of that's lost. Let's just use uh, Fred, uh, Fred's friend, Odessa. Put it this way. God is patient toward Odessa. Not wishing for Odessa to perish, but for Odessa to become to repentance. Folks, that, that changes the perspective a little bit when you put it personally with someone you know and do it that way. Folks, uh, let me just say in verse 10, uh, where, where we read, uh, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and with the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. God's delay is not eternal. There is an unrevealed time limit that, when, that, that God's going to come. Now, now when? <laughs> it doesn't give a time. He says it's going to come like a thief in the night. Uh, my friend Bob Utley he said, uh, he referenced that to a pregnant woman. You know, you know the child is going to come. You don't know the time. You don't know the exact moment. But then, when that first sharp pain comes, you know it's time. Folks, this is what he's telling us here. Think, think about with me here just for a moment with it. Children head off to school loaded with homework. They have peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in their lunch kit. Rush hour traffic clogs the freeway. Stores begin to open up and do business. And suddenly, in the twinkling of an eye, Christ will split the sky. God's plan takes center stage. It could be today. It could be today. Well, how is it going to happen? It says, well, it says heavens will pass away with a roar. This, everybody that I read talked about this roar is kind of like an air whizzing through the air. Whoosh, like the sound of Pentecost. Whoosh, the wind. It's what, it, what, it, what they're referring to there. Now, the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. Folks, the elements, I'm not sure what they understood about uh, the, the atomic structures then. But we know what, that, that God knew about them. And it says elements will be destroyed with intense heat. The basic building blocks of the world, earth, water, wind, whatever. Folks, I don't know 
in, in this world of, uh, of nuclear fission, uh, I understand that when, when Oppenheimer and those guys got together about the atomic bomb, they figured out that if you take the right kind of atom and you blast it with neutrons, that the atom splits. And when it splits, it creates intense heat and pressure. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like it, doesn't it? It says that the heavens and earth will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. And the earth and its works will be burned up, folks. I, you know, this, when you think about the, the bombs in, uh, in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, it says that they, it literally uh, vaporized things. That the heat was such intense it vaporized everything in its path. Folks, now, now I don't know if that's the way it's going to happen or not. I don't know if that's what he's talking about. But it sure sounds like it, and that's a popular opinion anyway. Now, the earth and its works will be burned up. The earth and its works will be burned up where we live right now. See, anything that is structured to allow man to be independent of God, that's the government, the education system, the religious system, buildings, inventions, whatever, achievements, nothing left for man to look for his own greatness because it's a thing of God. Man doesn't have a hand in all of that. So just keep that in mind. I think that's what he's talking about here, the how of, of that. Now, this cleansing sets the stage for the new heavens and the new earth. Revelation 21 describes the new Jerusalem. Now, will it be physical? Will it be Eden-like, Garden of Eden type? Or spiritual? Are the new heavens and earth literal or the apocalyptic? Folks, it's difficult to describe spiritual realities in human terms. Now, I choose to believe this new heaven and earth are literal. I choose to believe it will be a fully new Garden of Eden. I, I, I believe that that's, that's what's going to be when, when you see the new Jerusalem coming down. It is a brand new Garden of Eden. Bob Utley tells us, in the beginning it was God, man, and nature. And in the end, it will be God, man, and nature. So, will Fluffy be there, your, your pet dog? Well, there was animals in the Garden of Eden. We know that because he took the skin of one and gave Adam and Eve clothes. Well, so, I, I, you know, far, far be it for me to understand all I'm telling you. But I do know Revelation 21, 1, 2, and 3 says this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away. There's no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, not going up, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, God with us. And he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Perfect harmony, perfect peace, God with us. This is what Peter's talking about. It's going to happen. Second Peter 11, 12, and 13. Now, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, 
and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him. As also in these letters, speaking in them of these things, in which some things are hard to understand, which are untaught and unstable, distort. So they do also the rest of Scripture to their own destruction. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you will not carry it away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. What should we be doing in light of what Peter just told us? Well, one thing he said, be patient. Exercise some patience here. Now, let me ask you this about patience. W would you venture a guess how many times a day you look at your watch or you look at your phone for the time? Venture a guess, somebody. How many times a day? How many? Fifty? Ten times? In 2023, somebody figured this out. It was 144 times a day that we look at our watch or we look at our, our phone for the time. Now, Warren Wiersbe tells us this about that. The best thing you and I can do is stop looking at our watches and phones. Simply look by faith into the face of God and let him have his way in his time. What else should we be doing, guys, when we read these verses? Well, because everything's been destroyed by fire, it's, it's, it's over. It's over. We should live in holy conduct and, and, and godliness. Look, there's no use in getting, getting attached to earthly things, are there? They're going to burn up. I don't know how this intense heat is going to vaporize the stuff out there. And so we should be looking for the coming of the Lord while we wait. And we are to do the work of evangelism, and that is sharing the gospel with everyone we come in contact with. In reading those last few verses there, Peter simply says, beware, be ready. That summarizes the whole second Peter that we're reading this morning. In chapter 3, with, within five verses, Peter leaves his readers with four commands. One of them? Is be diligent, verse 14, and live in light of judgment in Christ's coming. Do not squirm in pain, but live in peace. 1 John 2, 28, Now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. Verse 15, be confident. Peter barred Paul's authority in his wisdom. See, there's never any conflict between Peter and Paul. They actually agreed on things. And, and so when you read that, he's using Paul's authority here to, to make a point. In verse 17, he says, be on guard. Do not get carried away by these false teachers. Do we have false teachers in the world today? Yeah, I mean, we got, we got more Gnostics out there. We call them something else, but they're, they're out there. Verse 18 says, be fruitful, to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord. Let me, let me just conclude with a few thoughts here. Folks, while the world can be scary and overwhelming, we know that day by day we live it. We can take solace in the fact that one day all suffering will end. It will be over. Let me read those. Let me just read those three verses for you again. And for starting in 21, verse 4. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no longer any death, no longer any mourning or crying or pain. The first thing that passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Folks, that's our Lord we're talking about there. You can take that one to the bank. It's going to happen. When the Lord returns, there will be a new heaven, a new earth, 
No more sickness or pain will exist. The Lord's timing is perfect. We have to know that now. We must be patient as we wait for him. I've got to work on that. Chuck Swindoll, he gave a, a, a great uh, acrostic of hope, H-O-P-E. The oach is heed what you already know. Folks, we know more than we do already, don't you? Pretty sure we do. Then the O is open your eyes and ears and discern the truth out there. The P, pursue a godly lifestyle. And E is expect Christ's return. And we see in that verse 18, Peter breaks into doxology. I want to close with this, and this is going to be our closing prayer. I want you to repeat after me. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Thank you all for being here today. Yeah.